Well, today on the show, how about a memoir? How about the true story of a girl from small town Arkansas who grows up to meet and marry one of the most controversial and one of the most celebrated authors in all of American literary history. Her name is Norris Church Mailer. This is her book, A Ticket to the Circus. And right now, she's about to be interviewed by Kane Webb on On the Same Page. Norris Church Mailer, welcome back to Arkansas. Thank you, Kane. So happy to be back. Yeah, and what brings you back is your new memoir, A Ticket to the Circus, right. which has one of the best titles I can imagine, <laughs> 33 Years of Life with Norman Mailer. Well, it seemed kind of appropriate. I was looking for a title for the book, and nothing leapt out at me. And one day I was talking to a girlfriend about my life and some yeah. of the things that happened, and I said, well, I bought a ticket to the circus. I don't know why I was surprised to see elephants. <laughs> and we looked at each other and we thought, that's a pretty good title. Yeah. <laughs> so I went with it, and, and I think it's pretty good, too. Well, the book's been out for a little while now, and it seems to be just about everywhere. I, I saw it in the New York Times Magazine you were interviewed, yeah. in the New York Book Review section, which came out the day before this interview, and you got a rave review there. I've seen it in Vanity Fair. Have you been a little surprised at the reaction to this yeah, book? Yeah, I, I have. I'm thrilled, obviously. Yeah. Um, I was hoping for, you know, for good reaction. You always hope for it. I, I've had a couple of novels out before which had decent, mm -hmm. but nothing like this. So I'm, I'm still kind of just flabbergasted. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right to the point here and read a section from the the very first prologue page of the of the prologue, okay. in which you say, uh, Norman has come down and says, when I'm gone and you write about me, I want you to say, and you write, I would invariably interrupt him. I'm not going to write about you. I'll never write about you. <laughs> Nobody would believe it. And yet, here I am here <laughs> with your book. You wrote about him. What, now, what brought that on? What changed your mind? I Why tell you, you it's, it's, a, it's kind of crazy because I really never wanted to write about him, and we did have this discussion many yeah. times. Um, and after he was gone, it was like, you know, when you're lying there at night and your mind starts to go, it's like my life kind of started playing out in my head like a movie. And I, I don't know, I just felt like I wanted to write some of it down. And in the beginning, it was going to be very different. I wanted to write kind of a cheaper by the dozen kind uh -huh. of book because I have, we have nine children and we used to spend summers together in Maine and, you know, all the funny stories that happened and, mm -hmm. you know, cooking and all this stuff and then I realized in short order that I didn't have a cheaper by the dozen kind of life <laughs> and that's when I decided to just write it and if I was going to write it I was going to tell the truth I was going to explain what happened because as I say in the book you know I don't have any skeletons in my closet yeah. they've all been in the pages of the New York Post and um, so it's all in the book, for better or for worse. Well, you, you tell it, uh, as we say in these parts, with the bark off. It doesn't yeah. seem as if you leave anything to chance or anything not, out. There's not much. I'm maybe a tiny little detail or yeah. two, but not much. <laughs> and when I interviewed you over the phone before this interview, you said, sometimes I worry if I told too much truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, d did I give too much of myself? Did, did, yeah. I, did I lay myself out there? to be judged and to have the truck run over me. You know, yeah. it's like, I don't know. But I, I just didn't feel like I could talk about my husband and his peccadilloes and the things he did if I didn't say that I was, you know, I had some yeah. too. I mean, I'm not a perfect person. I don't know who is. Maybe there are a few, but um, if I was going to talk about him, I was going to talk about me. So well, it, it just isn't just Norman. I mean, this is no. your life too. It starts. Yeah. Uh, for those viewers who don't know, you're from Atkins, mm -hmm. Arkansas, and you grew up there, and and then were uh, living and working in Russellville yeah. at Arkansas. T were you at Arkansas Tech or no, at high school? No, I was at school? Russellville High School. When yeah. I was teaching art. Okay, yeah. when you when you met Norman, mm -hmm. when tell us a little bit about how you met him, the circumstances <laughs> around that. You were 26 years old at the time. He oh, was 52. He was 52. I I'd, I'd been divorced for a couple of years and had a, a young son, Matthew, who was three, and. Um, I was really happy. I I had a great life. I, my mom and dad were here, and we were very close. I'm an only child, and mm -hmm. um, I loved my job, and I loved Arkansas, and I'd go to, you know, sort of 
places like War Eagle and do pencil portraits and the Ozark Folk Center. Yeah. And um, I was not in a hurry to leave. It wasn't like I wanted to catch the first guy out of New York and yeah. get out of here. You yeah. know, that wasn't the case at all. And um, but I, I had uh, kind of aspirations to write as well. I'd been in B.C. Hall's class at Arkansas Tech and um, had started a book, actually, with which I was calling Little Miss Little Rock at the time in his class. Which you were. Which I was. In fact, I was is, this, is this picture of you it's about from this, Little Miss Little Rock? It's about the same about time. About the same time? About yeah. how old were you? Three or four? I guess I was three when I was Little Miss Little yeah. Rock. That's about, I, I lived in Little Rock, I think, at that point. Oh, okay. But, but um, I moved to Atkins when I was about three or four. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, there was another teacher named Frances Irby Galtney who had been mm -hmm. in the war with Norman and knew him really well, and they visited each other. And I'd, I'd happened to be at Tech that day with my senior class going to another friend's class in film animation. This, uh, this whole thing is such a string yeah. of things that if this hadn't happened and that hadn't happened, I, I would never have met Norman. But Norman was next door in Francis's class, and somebody told me, and I said, "Oh wow, I just got this book, Marilyn. You know, let me go get my book signed." And because, I mean, I did not think about romance. He mm -hmm. was older than my father; I knew that. Um, but when I I went with my book to get signed, I took a look at him, and he didn't look so old. He, you know, he looked kind of cute, and <laughs> um, just one of those light bulb things went off. It, I don't know how you can put it any better than that. And what I love about that story in the book is that you were a member of the Book of the Month Club, yes. right? And you had usually got a form, if I remember, mm -hmm. and you had to fill out that you didn't want the book right. and you forgot to do that and, and got to. Maryland. I know, because I would not have bought that book. It was $20. It was like, <laughs> I, you, know, you can't afford a $20 book when you're a teacher. And, um, and so you read it and were intrigued by yeah, this writer, and yeah. you thought he wasn't anything like his reputation from what <laughs> you read there. Yeah. I know. I thought, oh, this man must be sensitive. He must really understand women. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I guess he did to a certain well, extent. Well, yeah. he did. He loved women. Yeah. He loved women. Yeah. He was not a misogynist. So you write in the book, and I like this a lot, that, that and you just alluded to this, that you weren't looking to leave Arkansas, no. that you liked your life here. I did. And, and uh, planned to, to stay here, right? Yeah. You, well, what, what would have happened had you not met Norman Mailer? You know, I've thought about that many times. There's a movie called Sliding Doors. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it. I think it's Gwyneth Paltrow, and she comes to the subway, and once she gets there and the doors close in her face and she doesn't get the train, and then they play the story all over, and she gets there, and she does get on the train. So it's two totally different stories. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I had planned to go back to, to college and get my MFA and teach at Tech. I, I loved Russellville. I still love Russellville. Every yeah. time I go back, there's a little house I look at and say, oh, you know, if I really had a lot of money, I'd buy this little house and move back here part of the time. And, uh, so, you know, I've never really left it in my yeah. heart. Yeah, you still live in, in Brooklyn. In though, Brooklyn, too. yeah. 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 Um, when when you did, uh, you met Norman. You moved to New York. Yeah. Uh, what was the reaction in Atkins and Russell? Because he had a reputation at that point, just well, literarily and, and other. I think part of them were sorry for me, and part of them were sorry for him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but part of them thought, oh, she's going to come to her senses and move back, and yeah. this won't last long, and. Uh, let her get this out of her system, and I don't know, somehow it lasted 33 years. So you were 26 at the time. Yeah. Were you just incredibly naive to think you could move to New York with Norman and make a life, or were you that brave to do it and sure yourself? I, I think it was a little of both. Yeah. I was pretty naive, and but you know, I'd, I'd taken care of myself. I was supporting my son. I didn't get child support. Mm -hmm. uh, I was taking care of him and me, and we had our life, and I figured, well, if it doesn't work out in New York, I'll come back here. I'll go yeah. back to teaching, or I'll do something else. It'll be an adventure. It'll be fun. Um, it was an adventure. It was, yeah. <laughs> when you sat down to write this memoir, had you kept um, notes over the years? Had you, did you have an idea of what I was gonna, you were going to say before you sat down and did it, or just kind of flow out, this is my story, here it is, boom? You know, it, it kind of was a gift. Yeah. It just kind of flowed out. I didn't have an outline. I didn't really have a lot of diaries. There were a few things I needed to check dates on, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I found, like, I, f I found the old ticket where I first came to New York. It was stuck in a book. Oh my gosh! And um, so I had that date. 
but no, it, it's it's really it really is a memoir. It really just came right out of my memories. Yeah. yeah. For better or for worse, I have a little forward where I say memory is treacherous, treacherous, and I think everything in this book happened. At least it's it's real to me. What what, um, what do you think he would have thought of the book? I don't know. I think there's part of it he would be really upset about and part of it he would love and I think he would tell me it was really well written and he was proud uh -huh. of me for that. So that that kind of was the big thing. If it's well written, it's okay. <laughs> Did he, now you you wrote a, a few things that you let him see. Yeah, and he, well, I let him see them, but I never let him see them before they were published. Oh, really? Mm -mm. You, would, you would not let him edit? No. no. Because you knew he'd change everything. Yes, he couldn't resist. He did. When we first got together, we sh we wrote a lot of letters, some of which are in this book. And the first letter I wrote to him, I sent this little poem, mm -hmm. and he sent it back to me red penciled. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So that should have been a clue. <laughs> <laughs> but he couldn't keep his hands off of something. If he was reading it, he had to be marking on it. He couldn't resist. And um, oh yeah, yeah. So I was afraid to show him anything. Yeah. How did he write? When he would, did he hole himself up? For days at a time, did you see him? Did he? I mean, what was his it process? Was, it was like an office, kind of. He did go uh, when we lived in New York. He had a studio he went to every day outside the house, and then in Provincetown he had a studio on the top floor. But he would go up and he'd work for you know three or four hour chunk, and uh, he was uh, he was a professional. I learned from him how to be a professional. If you're going to be a writer, you have to treat it like a job. Yeah. You can't just write when you feel like it or when the spirit moves you because you'll never get anything done. You have to go and sit down at two o'clock every day if that's your choice or yeah. six in the morning, whatever you like. And just sit there and, you know, get pull your work up. I work on a computer. He mm -hmm. wrote longhand. He did. Mm hmm. He never He never, never keyed it no, in. Never, not more. He had someone else key it in for him. He typed the naked and the dead and after that he could afford a secretary. Interesting. So he never did it again. And he did he feel as if the writing was, was better longhand, do mm -hmm. you think? He did. Did yeah. you did you read his work before he would send it to the? To oh the sure, editor? yeah. He let me do it. He he yeah. was good about letting me comment on his work. And I mean, occasionally he would even take a suggestion. Oh uh, yeah. Not very often. Were you, were you a gentle editor, or did you tell him? No, I was, was. I was tough. <laughs> <laughs> I was mean. <laughs> Um, when uh, you were married to Norman, did you get back to Arkansas with him much? And what did, what did sure. he think yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, we came back every state. year. We yeah. came back at least a couple times a year. He loved it here. Yeah. Well, he used to come back and visit Francis all the time before he met me. So he he already had a love for the state, and um, oh, we had lots of fun. We went to Eureka and mm -hmm. and. Uh, and you the, still have friends there, you said. Yeah, I have yeah. friends there, and we, which I love. I go see them like every year. And yeah. um, he he fell in love with Bubba's barbecue, and we went to the Passion Play. I mean, he just loved everything about it. I'm surprised he did. He ever write about Arkansas at all, or was he tempted? Not not head on. I don't think he always yeah. said he always said that you know he wanted to take my little house I grew up in and uh, come back here and write. For a while, but it's something we never did. Yeah, yeah. he, uh, but he's a, he was a New York boy all the way, yeah, correct? He was. Yeah, he was. Um, what was your favorite Mailer book, uh, and did you tell him I like this one better than that one? Oh, he knew. He was he was happy with my choice. I think I'm, I like I love a lot of them. Um, yeah. My favorite of all the books, I think, if I had to pick one, is Ancient Evenings, which almost nobody's read, but it's such a magical, wonderful book. I read it every few years just for fun and uh -huh. there's always something I'd forgotten or that leaps out at me I didn't remember. It's, it's You go and you live in this, this strange land of ancient Egypt for a while and, yeah. and it's kind of wonderful. I love Oswald's tale. Um, Executioner song is wonderful. I mean, so many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about life with Norman uh, when he wasn't working? The parties and the and the liter <laughs> literary scene in New York, which you talk about quite a bit. I do. In, I do. In the book. Yeah, we we went out a lot. He was, you know, writing a solitary activity, and he wanted to go out at night, and so we we go to dinner parties, and we gave a lot of parties, and we had the family over, and yeah. So it was it was action all the time at night. Was was your apartment in Brooklyn where you still live? You still mm -hmm. live in the. I still live in the. Was that kind of ground zero for that the, was, the was, liter literature set? It was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. T tell us a little bit about the the part in the book where you describe one party, and I think it has something to do with coleslaw, and then there's oh my God, yes. and then there's <laughs> Hunter S. Thompson who's passed out the next morning, and you. In give us hammock. a little, pre yeah. Give us a little recap of that, which is hysterical. Well, I this was the first big party we gave together as a couple, mm -hmm. so this was kind of our debut, and we 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 don't have a big place. It holds yeah. maybe fifty people. 
is a lot, and I don't know how many people came, a hundred or two, yeah. and they were crammed in there. We were all kind of you know, trying to eat, and I'd, I'd made, Norman told me that he made this great coleslaw, uh -huh. and I was like, coleslaw? And I said, well, what, for a party? And the party started at 10 o'clock at night, which I wasn't used to. <laughs> And I said, well, people are going to want to eat coleslaw at 10 o'clock at night. He said, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll have eaten hours ago. They'll be hungry again. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay, well, I'll make a ham, you know, because I made ham. So and I made the southern girl. I'll make the ham. And the, yeah. Cornbread. I don't know. I mean, I made this whole big spread that nobody touched. And we had this bowl of coleslaw. We spent all day long slicing coleslaw. And it was, I think, a tub this big, yeah. a big thing of it, which was in the middle of the table. I don't, I don't guess two people tasted that coleslaw. <laughs> And the party went on and on and on. I was just half dead when it was yeah, over, like yeah. 6 o'clock in the morning or something. And I thought, well, let me get this coleslaw out of here so I don't have to face it. And I picked the thing up and start going toward the kitchen and drop it on the road. Oh, my gosh. And it breaks, and the coleslaw goes everywhere. And it's like, oh, no, I'm so tired. And now, I where start, was Norman? Was he asleep he's at in this bed. point? He, yeah, he, he had, like, gone to bed. Okay. So I was like scraping up coleslaw and broken pottery and crying yeah. and I got the thing kind of cleaned up and the doorbell rang and it's Hunter Thompson and he's like, you know, he comes in and he's pretty rough and <laughs> I said, Hunter, the party's over and he said, he said, can you just make me some bacon and eggs? <laughs> and I said, okay. Did you make them for him? I made them. I made him bacon Did and Did you eggs. have a flashback of it? Okay, I'm this girl from Atkins, Arkansas. I'm here in Norman Mailer's apartment making, making eggs. Making bacon and eggs at 6 o'clock in the Thompson. morning for Hunter S. Thompson. I know, what am what I did, doing what here? What did I sign We're not in for. Kansas anymore. Yeah. Um, and he ate the breakfast, and then we had a hammock that was kind of slung over our, our house. Part of it is an A frame. Yeah. And he climbed up into the hammock, and he jumped into the hammock, and he lay there and fell asleep. And he slept there all day long. This is Thompson. Yeah. yeah. And about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he kind of flipped out of the hammock and said, thanks for great party, Norris, and walked out the door <laughs> like, you know, like he did that every day. <laughs> did you ever get used to that kind of life? Or was there still a part of you who was a small town girl who was well, quite sure of this stuff? I've never been starstruck. Yeah. You know, I've never been like, oh, my God, there's, you know, Bob Dylan or somebody. I didn't. I wasn't like that, but you never quite get used to having Hunter Thompson up there in your hammock. I mean, <laughs> it's always something new to get used to. <laughs> we are talking about A Ticket to the Circus by Norris Church Mailer, also known here locally as Barbara Jean Davis, and you're still Barbara Davis when you, I'm still when you Barbara, come to Arkansas, I'm right? I'm Barbara Davis forever. Forever. <laughs> Tell us the story about how you how you uh, got the name Norris Church Mailer because that's an interesting little anecdote. Well, it's kind too. of it's kind of a boring little story. I I had married a boy named Larry Norris who uh -huh. was my first husband and went to New York as Barbara Norris and I did some modeling for Wilhelmina uh, for a few years and Wilhelmina thought it was a really boring name, Barbara Norris. I said, oh, that's not much of a model uh -huh. name. So why don't you just be Norris, you know, like Iman or Apollonia or somebody, you know, and I was the like, one name, yeah. okay, one name, that's good, I'll do that. And um, then I realized you can't go through life with one name, you mm -hmm. need driver's license and stuff. So Norma and I were sitting down saying, well, what, what goes with Norris if that's going to be my first name? And he said, well, you're a good Baptist, you went to church three times a week, why don't you call yourself church? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it was just that silly, and, name and was that, born. Yeah. And, and it was. And really, if I had it to do over, I probably would not have done that. But it's my name, and yeah. there it is. <laughs> the, a, a big part of this book is devoted to um, family. Yeah. Uh, you know, you kind of tie together this huge, intricate Mailer family. Um, yeah, uh, you mentioned you so. thought about a cheaper by the dozen mm -hmm. type of approach to it. Yeah. Um, uh, what was what was that experience like to kind of be the essentially the matriarch of this family with so many different branches and how did you keep it together? Well, it, it could have turned out so badly and it turned out so beautifully. Um, my oldest stepdaughter is my age. I'm six months older than her and then mm. the next one is eight years younger. So I have, they're, they're kind of like my sisters and kind of like mm -hmm. my friends and mm -hmm. uh, there's there's nine of them all together. John, John, who's here with me today, is our youngest. Uh, he's the only one that Norman and I had together and then Matthew from my first marriage was with us and um, they were just great kids and they had, especially the older ones, had been through so many different marriages and they were, I wouldn't say shattered, that's not the word because they weren't shattered, but they were, it, it had been hard for them to have different stepmothers yeah. and different places to live and stuff. I mean, Norman was married five times before he met me and I think he's, 
left each of those children before they were six. Hmm. So it was really hard on them. And I was younger and we played, you know. I, was, yeah. I wasn't trying to boss them around or be their mother or, I mean, they had mothers so I could be their friend and we just had fun and um, we had a great time and we still do. Yeah. The portion of the book in which you find out about his infidelities after you've been married for a while, yeah. and the family seems to rally around you yeah, and not did. Norman. Yeah, well. Uh, they, were they <laughs> just, they'd reached a point where they were put out with him? They, they were a little annoyed at him, yeah, yeah I would, think, I would yeah. say that. Yeah. Why did you stay with him in the end? You know, everyone always asks that, you know, well, he cheated on you, why didn't you just leave? It's, um, it's not a good thing to cheat, and I wouldn't recommend it at all, but yeah. There's other, there's other things when you break up a marriage. I, we'd been together at that point 16 years. Mm -hmm. We had the kids. I'd had this relationship with my family. I loved my life. I loved the kids. I loved our social life. I loved everything about. I loved him. And and when you break up a marriage, you just leave all that. Mm -hmm. You just you, you just like amputate a limb and to go off and start a whole new life with a whole new set of circumstances. It's hard. It's yeah. not so easy, um, and he clearly especially when when he he didn't want me to leave. If he if he had acted differently, if he had said, "I'm not giving up the women," you know, forget mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. then I would have left. I couldn't have stayed under those circumstances. But he didn't say that. He didn't. He wanted to give up the women. He wanted to be um, just you know just the two of us again. For for a very long time after we got together, he was true. He he wanted to be monogamous. Mm -hmm. he, that was part of. The plan when we got together, he said, I'm tired of cheating, I'm tired of running around, I just mm -hmm. want to have a family life. And we had a great one for a number of years, and uh, I guess that's why I got lulled into this, you know, thinking he, everything was fine, and it's, it was such a shock, because yeah. people say, why were you so shocked? Well, I was, I was shocked. It, it seemed as if you, you repaired uh, the marriage a little bit through letters. Mm -hmm. You started writing to each other, which we you had did. done when you first, mm -hmm. and I guess throughout your marriage, right? You always we wrote did. back and forth. We did. We did. Every time I had something serious to talk to him about, I'd write him right. a letter. Because when you speak to someone, they don't really listen to you. They're thinking about what they're going to say next or, yeah. you know, something. And they don't absorb what you're saying. But if it's there in black and white, especially to a writer, then, they, then, they, get, then uh, they get all uh, the nuances. So, yeah. And he appreciated that he too, did, I guess. Yeah. 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 The first thing I did when I found out about the infidelities was write him a letter and faxed it to him, because he was still in Provincetown. And the first thing he said was, "Well, you're really a writer." <laughs> and I said, "Are you trying to flatter me?" And he said, "Yes." <laughs> and I said, "Well, I'm flattered, but <laughs> nevertheless." <laughs> was there a uh, part of this memoir that was especially difficult? to write, that you wanted to fudge a little bit or, or pull your punches or, or maybe smooth over? Since he was gone, who would know, you know? I, I really wasn't tempted to do that um, yeah. because I had decided to tell the truth. And I'm, I'm kind of weird about that. I, uh -huh. I just, I don't like to, I would not have felt good about myself if I had lied, Yeah, which it would have been. And he would have known. In some well, he would have known, yeah. yeah. We got some zots on the back of my head, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, well, what are you up to now, besides this tour, which I'm sure is going to extend forever since you're getting such good press? Oh, the tour keeps going on. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually working on another project, um, which, which kind of came, came out of the blue. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to talk about it too much yet, but okay. it's, it's kind of... Writing project? Or? It's a writing project, yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to write it as a screenplay first and, and maybe as a novel, so... Now you've written two novels I've before written two this novels, yeah. memoir. Do mm -hmm. you have another book in you, you think? Yeah, yeah. I, think I think this one could be a novel. Uh, and a, I'm going to do it as a screenplay first. Um, I have a, someone who took an option, so... Well, that sounds great. What about your painting? I know you, that I, was throughout wanna, the book you always I want to get back to the painting. It's just so hard to find time. Yeah. Yeah. You talk a little bit also about your place in Provincetown mm -hmm. that meant so much to you guys. You mm -hmm. always went there for summers. What's yeah. Now that's now like a writer's colony, Yeah, we turned it? it into a writer's colony, which is so exciting. All yeah. these young writers are getting to write in that house. It's, it's kind of a wonderful place to write. You walk in the front door and it's like you get this ah oh, feeling, you know. It's like a very serene, lovely place with the, the it's right on the beach. And, uh -huh. uh, People, all, the kids always used to love to come up and write there because you just get a lot of work done. But you wrote it in Brooklyn. 
I wrote in Brooklyn and Provincetown. Yeah. The last 10 years of Norman's life, we pretty much lived in Provincetown. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thank Welcome you, back Kay. to Arkansas. You say you're in Atkins and Russellville and then in Eureka. Is that right? I was in Atkins and Russellville and Eureka, and I'm going to Blytheville tomorrow. All right. No, Little Rock tomorrow. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. And then Blytheville. Does it still seem the same? Arkansas, or has it changed a lot? Oh, it's it? changed a lot, but it's still the same. Yeah. It's, it's the same, but different. Do you describe yourself as an Arkansas girl, or are you a Brooklyn girl at this point? I think at this point I have to say I'm a mix, because I've been that's there longer okay. than I was here, but <laughs> but, I'm, but Arkansas is still me. I mean, that's, that's who I, I am. I detect a little bit of the accent coming back when you come. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, it's, <laughs> it's always there. They think I have a really heavy one in New York. Thank you, Norris, for visiting with us. Thank you, Appreciate Kane. it. Good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you.